So in this video, we're going to be talking about how to design a logging system. So what we mean by a log system is anything that can take in unstructured log data from a number of services that we have configured and can store that large quantity of data in such a way that a person can easily query that data and get access to historical insights. This is pretty common in a lot of large scale systems where we have multiple services that are all producing logs and we need some way to store that massive quantity of log data in real time. So let's think about some requirements that we would have for a system like this. The first functional requirement that we have is we want to be able to have have real-time log ingestion from our producers of logs. So our producers are those services that are producing those logs that we want to store in our system. We also want to make sure that we can query those logs efficiently if we want to do some analysis. These are going to be time series logs, so our query patterns are often going to be restricted to a specific time range. We also want to make sure that we have lots of storage available for our historical log data. In terms of non-functional requirements, we really want to make sure that we have low cost for infrequently accessed data. So this means that data that's really, really old and isn't being updated or read very frequently shouldn't be stored on high cost storage. We also want to make sure that, on the other hand, we have high throughput for log ingestion, meaning that we should be able to ingest extremely large quantities of logs from our various systems without slowing those systems down. And finally, we want to make sure that we have fast query speed for when we need to actually access those logs. All right, so let's take a look at how we'd actually go about building this system. We're going to keep it fairly high level for this video, and we're going to cover a lot of topics that you may or may not have seen. And if you want to learn about those topics in more detail, check out interviewpen.com for our full course on system design. So to start off, let's take a look at a naive solution where we only have a single server that's responsible for ingesting these logs. So in this example, right, we have one node that's storing all of our logs and is handling all of the input from all of our various services. We also have our person that might want to query those logs, and they can send those queries directly to that one node. This works perfectly fine for most small-scale logging systems, and it's really important to note that if we don't have a very large quantity of logs that we're ingesting, this is perfectly fine. However, if we have a lot of load coming from our producing services, this could be too much load for this one node to handle, and this would bog down this server as well as potentially our services themselves. So in order to come up with a solution that will scale to this extreme quantity of log ingestion, we need to come up with a way to distribute our logs onto multiple machines. An intuitive approach to this would be sharding. So let's say our log system is going to consist of three machines. We'd use some sort of hashing algorithm to determine which of those three nodes our data would be stored on every time we make a request. This means that our writes are distributed across these three nodes, so each machine is only handling a third of the write throughput of our entire system. And it also means that a random third of the entire data set would be stored on each one of these nodes. So this works great from our write perspective. However, from our read perspective, we have a problem because our users that are querying this data now have to look at every single node to get all the data that they're looking for. Because we haven't come up with a way yet to efficiently organize this data, the segment of data that we'll probably be looking for when we query this data is likely to be scattered across all three of these nodes. This means that while our write performance is good here, our read performance when we're querying this data is very, very bad. So instead of sharding our data using a hashing algorithm, a better solution might be to use bucketing, which means that each one of our nodes will be responsible for a certain time time range. So for example, our first node might be responsible for the years 2022 to now, where the second node might be responsible for 2020 to, and 2021, and our third node might be responsible for 2018 and 2019. Of course, as we add more times, these nodes might be responsible for multiple time ranges that are not contiguous, and we can use a hashing algorithm similar to one we'd find for a sharded database to determine which time ranges are assigned to which nodes. So this solves our query problem pretty nicely. If we're looking for a certain time period, which we often are for log data, the person querying the data can find that entire time span on a single node for most ranges of data. However, we now run into the problem that we had before with writing here, as now all of our logs are being sent to the very first node, which is responsible for that present time data. So while we're distributing our read requests and we're distributing our storage of the logs, we're running into the exact same problem that we had with our single node naive solution with our writes all being sent to a single node. So as we'll often see in systems like this, the best solution is a combination of the previous two approaches. We'll still want to bucket our data in some way. However, within each bucket, we can have multiple nodes that are assigned to that time range so that we can efficiently distribute our writes across those nodes. So in this example, we now have nine nodes in our cluster. Our writes are being distributed across the first three, and the other six are used for storing historical data, and that's where our queries would be going if we're querying historical data. So if we're taking a look at a specific point in time, we can see that this system works great. However, we still 
still have to think about how we can move the data across these nodes. Otherwise, this segment of three nodes that's responsible for the present time data would continue growing in size forever, and our other six nodes would always stay the same. We want to make sure that we can have high throughput on our hot nodes that are responsible for current data, while we have cheaper cold storage that's responsible for this older data. Now we simply need some way that we can migrate the data from our high-speed storage to our cold storage. So let's take a look at a way to do that. So the first thing that's really important to keep in mind when we're thinking about how to design this is that our cold storage is going to be slower than our hot storage. So for the sake of example, let's say that our cold storage is two times slower, which means that if we're capable of ingesting a certain amount of data within a time period, it'll take twice that time period to transfer that data to cold storage. In order to make sure that we're dealing with this situation, we're going to want to make sure that we have extra nodes that we can cycle through while we're moving data to cold storage. So let's take a look at an example of how this would actually work. So we'll start off in the time period from 2018 to 2019. And during this time period, let's say that we ingest two petabytes of data. All of this data will be sent to these three nodes here. So we can see that after this time period, we have these three nodes storing two petabytes of data and responsible for data from 2018 to 2019. Now let's move on to 2020 to 2021, and we can see that our producers are sending their data to this next set of nodes here. So we now have two petabytes of data stored here. This set of nodes is responsible for data from 2020 to 2021. But while this was all happening, we were also able to move some of our data from 2018 into cold storage. Remember that this takes twice as long as ingesting the data. So during this period of two years, we were able to move one petabyte of data into cold storage. So we now have 2019's data still in this hot storage, and 2018's data is now stored in cold storage. So finally, let's move on to the time period from 2022 to 2023. We're ingesting another two petabytes of data into this last set of nodes, and we've now finished moving all of the data out of our 2018-2019 nodes into cold storage. Now for the future, we can see that we have another set of nodes that we can now use to ingest this new data, and now we can start moving this next set of nodes into cold storage. We'd of course need more nodes for cold storage since we're moving multiple data sets simultaneously, but we can see that as long as we have these three sets of nodes to cycle through, we're able to handle the throughput of ingesting new data while migrating old data to slower cold storage. So now that we've seen a basic overview of how these logging systems work, let's take a look at some next steps. One really important thing to look into if you want to learn more about these systems would be sharding and how it's implemented in databases. Sharding was critical to the solution that we came up with here, and there's a lot of details that can go into it, and it's really important to learn about how these systems actually work if you want to fully understand the solution. In a real-world system, we'd also want to make sure that we're doing the math to see how many nodes we really need. This would involve taking a look at how much storage space we need, how many writes we're doing, how frequent those writes are, and how frequently we're reading old data to come up with the hardware and the number of nodes that we'd need both for our hot and our cold storage. There's also a lot of problems involving optimizing network traffic with these systems, since we're moving such large quantities of data within our cluster. It's also really important to consider data replication and fault tolerance in systems like this, since we want to make sure that we don't lose our historical log data if a node fails. And finally, it's good to look into existing solutions such as Elasticsearch that have already solved all of these problems, and it's good to take a look at how these systems work and learn about the trade-offs that they made when designing it. If you enjoyed this video, you can find more content like this on interviewpen.com. We have tons of more in-depth system design and data structures and algorithms content for any skill level, along with a full coding environment and an AI teaching assistant. You can also join our Discord, where we're always available to answer any questions you might have. If you or a friend wants to master the fundamentals of software engineering, check us out at interviewpen.com.